Sheikh began by praising Allah Azza wa Jal and sending salutations of peace and blessings upon our Nabi and Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that our subject matter today are the differences that exist between the Al-Imamiyya and Ahl Sunnah. سيكون إن شاء الله إثبات الفروق من المصادر المعتمدة عند الشيعة الإمامية. He said that these differences that are going to be mentioned, they are going to be mentioned, and they are supported by the texts that these people use in their books. القضية الأولى التي يحصل التفريق فيها بين السنة وبين الإمامية. He said that the very first issue that there are distinctions between Ahl Sunnah and the Imamiyya, and it is a mammoth distinction and difference. It is a difference of a Tawheed. He said that a Tawheed with Ahl Sunnah, it has three different categories. And those three different categories are Tawheed, Al Uluhiyya, the right that Allah has to be worshipped, and a Tawheed, Al Rububiyya, the oneness that Allah has in His Lordship, and the Tawheed of Al Asma'i wa Al Sifati. The oneness and uniqueness of Allah in His names and attributes. Al Uluhiyya, Tawheed al Ibada, wa Tawheed Allah Taala bi Afhal al Ibad, bi an tusraf al Ibadat lillah Azza wa Jal. Wa li ajli hada Tawheed, arsal Allah al Rusul, wa anzal Allah al Kutub, wa laqad baghtna fi kulli ummat al Rasoola an ibud Allah wa jtani bil Taawut. The Sheikh said, "As for Tawheed, Al Uluhiyya." as well as called Tawheed Al-Ibadah. The meaning of it with Ahl Sunnah is for the servants to single Allah out in their worship towards Him. And because of this Tawheed Al-Uluhiyah or Al-Ibadah, Allah Ta'ala, He sent the messengers and He revealed the books as He mentioned in the Quran. And verily, we sent to every nation a Rasul. And they told their people, worship Allah and stay away from the false deities. In the man could tamala kutub al imamiya shia, lejidu an natawheed al uluhiya indahum, muhalifu li tawheed il ledi arsal allahu bi rasulahu muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam. The individual who takes the opportunity to read, look at, and to read the books of the imamiya is going to find that their understanding of tawheed al uluhiya. It goes against and it's in conflict with what Al Sunnah understand to be Tawheed and Uluhiyya. But Tawheed عندهم هو الإيمان الإيمان بإمامة علي والأئمة من بعده والشرك هو الشرك في ولاية علي والأئمة من بعده. He said with them, a Tawheed is to have an Iman to believe in the ولاية of علي. And the imams who came after Ali, and a shirk to them is for the person who rejects the wilaya of Ali and the wilaya of the imams who came after Ali. ففي قول الله تعالى ولقد أوحي إليك وإلى الذين من قبلك لئن أشركت لا يحبط النعملك جاء في تفسيرها في الكافي وهو من الكتب من الكتب المعتمدة عندهم يعني إن أشركت في الولاية غيره. يعني أشركت في في الولاية في ولاية علي غيره هذا موجود في كتاب الكافي في المجلد الأول صفحة أربعمية وسبعة وعشرين. Sheikh said to prove from their masadim and their books that their tawheed is against our tawheed. There's an ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa taala said, 
And verily we had revealed to you, and we revealed to the messengers before you, that if any of you were to make ship with me, then you will lose all of your good deeds, and you'll be of those people who are the chaserim, the losers. He said in the book that they have, it's a book called al kafi It's in volume 1, page 426. In the tafsir of this ayat, they said that it means that anyone who makes shirk in the wilaya of Ali, then this, this ayat is referring to them. Amma sahib kitab mira. مرآة الأنوار صفحة 202 فيقول إن الأخبار متضافرة في تأويل الشرك بالله الشرك بعبادته بالشرك في الولاية والإمامة And there's another book that they have called مرآة مرآة الأنوار مر... مرآة الأنوار the illuminated lights that they said in page 202 that the meaning of polytheism or shirk with them is for anyone to take the right that Ali had to be in charge of to have the al-wilaya. That's the meaning of a shirk in that book. Ammal falwilaya عند الشيعة الإمامية هي أصل قبول العمل. فالعمل إن سلم من الشرك يرجى لصاحبه الجنة وهو تحت المشيئة. لأن الله يقول إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء والله سبحانه وتعالى يقول إنما يتقبل الله من المتقين فشرط قبول العمل عند أهل السنة الإخلاص لله تعالى والمتابعة للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم شيخ said that these people they understand that in order for a person's deeds to be accepted then he has to support and he has to acknowledge and embrace this whole concept of al-wilaya. And if he were to do that, then he will be saved. Whereas, on the other hand, our case is if the person were to be saved from his shirk and he didn't fall into shirk, then the paradise is for him. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, verily Allah does not forgive, Allah will forgive anything other than shirk. Verily, Allah does not forgive that you make shit with him, but he forgives anything other than that to whoever he wants to forgive. And he also mentioned in the Quran, verily, Allah makes the acceptance of the deeds from the muttaqeen, those people who have a taqwa. The Shaykh says, so with us, Ahl Sunnah, being saved, going to paradise, it is for a person to have ikhlas, to be sincere, and for a person to follow the Nabi with the mutabi'ah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فمن كان مؤمنا عندهم بولاية الأئمة ولو جاء بقراب الأرض خطايا فهو مغفور له عندهم. نعم. He said with those people, whoever he accepts and he believes in the wilaya, even if he filled up the whole world with sins and mistakes, then he is مغفور, he is forgiven, and his deeds will be accepted. ومن جاء بأعمال صالحة كالجبال ولكنه لا يؤمن بولاية الأئمة فهو حابط العمل في النار. And in contrast to that, they believe that if a person comes and he comes with iman and he does all of the good deeds and he does deeds that fill up the world, but he doesn't believe in the wilaya, then in them, in their case, what they believe is he won't be a believer. في أمال الطوسي المجلد الأول صفحة 314 ما يثبت ذلك يقول لو جاء أحدكم يوم القيامة بأعمال كأمثال الجبال ولم يجي بولاية علي بن أبي طالب لأكبه الله عز وجل بالنار He said the proof of that is in a book that he mentioned page 313 that the author of the book said if one of you were to come يوم القيامة with the deeds the size of a large mountain and you did not accept and embrace and believe in the wilaya of Ali and then for sure that individual is going to enter into the hellfire. وَالْأَئِمَّةَ عِنْدَهُمْ هُمُ الْوَاسِطَةَ بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَبَيْنَ خَلْقِهِ فَأَهْلُ السُنَّةِ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِأَنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالرُّسُلِ وَصَائِطِ فِي تَبْلِيغِ الشَّرَائِعِ وَأَمْرِ النَّاسِ بما أوجبه الله عليهم ونهيهم عما حرمه الله عليهم أما أن تكون 
الأنبياء والرسل وصائط لها ما لله من جلب النفع ودفع الضر تفريج الكربات وإجابة الدعوات فهذا عند أهل السنة كفر وشرك بالله عز وجل الشيخ سيدات بإمام بإمامز of the Imamiyah they are the middlemen and the ones who they use to get to Allah عز وجل but with Ahl al-Sunnah Ahl al-Sunnah they believe that the prophets and the messengers Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'een their job and their function is to explain the Sharia the Sharia that Allah Ta'ala gave to the people and that they order the people what Allah ordered them to do and they prohibit the people from what Allah Azza wa Jalla prohibited the people from doing as for the one who puts a middleman between him and Allah an intercessor an intermediary between him and Allah and he believes that that intermediary will benefit him or push off him evil or get him out of problems or accept the da'wah that he makes when he makes a dua and the sunnah believe that this is kufr and shirk in Allah ولهذا يقول المجلسي في بحار الأنوار صفحة مجلة 23 صفحة 97 عن هؤلاء الأئمة إنهم حجب الرب والوسائط بينهم وبين الخلق For that reason the Sheikh is mentioning from their masadir is that this man المجلسي he wrote a book called بحار الأنوار in the volume 13 215 he said that their imams are the partitions and the concealment between Allah and his creation. And they have to believe in that. ولهذا عندهم يجوزون الاستغاثة بالأئمة. وهذه الاستغاثة التي لا يقدر عليها إلا الله عز وجل فيعتقدون في أمتهم أنهم يجلبون المنافع ويرفعون الضراء ويكشفون البلاء ويشفون من المرض والله عز وجل يقول أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء. The Sheikh said that these people, as a result of this belief in the Emma, they believe that it's permissible to make an istighatha with their Emma to seek assistance and help in things that they need from the Emma, and they seek the help and assistance with their Imams in things that only Allah has the ability to do. Their imams, on the other hand, they believe that they can help them in bringing them the benefits that they need in their lives, protecting them from the harms, protecting them from the trials and the tribulations, protecting them from sicknesses, when in fact we find that Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, and who is the one who will answer the call of the one who has problems other than Allah, and he takes off of him those problems that are affecting him. ولهذا جاء في بحار الأنوار أما علي بن الحسين فللنجاة من السلاطين ونفث الشياطين هذا إمام من أئمتهم وأما محمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد فللآخرة وما تبتغيه من طاعة الله عز وجل. The Sheikh said also in that book that we mentioned بحار الأنوار they said that علي بن حسين the man wrote in that book that علي بن حسين he is the one who will protect you from the oppression of the leaders, from the Salatin. And he will protect you from the attacks of the Shayateen, of a Shaytan. As for Muhammad ibn Ali and Jafar ibn Muhammad, then that is another issue. ولهذا يعددون الأئمة عندهم فهذا لكذا وذاك لكذا والله سبحانه وتعالى عندهم لا منزلة عنده ولا قيمة له. فلم يبقوا لله عز وجل شيء بل جعلوا كل التصريف هو أو التصريف خاص بهؤلاء الأئمة التي الذين يعظمونهم. Concerning the Tawheed, إخواني, being in the أئمة, the ولاية of the أئمة, the Sheikh he mentioned that they consider their imams and their leaders that they are responsible for different things. They'll say that this imam is responsible for this particular thing and that one is responsible for something else. This one is responsible for a third thing, and another is responsible for a fourth thing. And in their distribu distribution of the responsibilities of the Imam, they don't leave any responsibility with Allah Allah, according to them, is not responsible for anything. It's their Imams who they have made responsible for their needs. 
ولهذا الحج وهي الحج عبادة عظيمة يعتقد ذلك أهل الإسلام وهي من أركان الإسلام ولكن الشيعة الإمامية يفضلون التقرب إلى مشهد الحسين أعظم من الحج إلى بيت الله الحرام ففي كتابهم وسائل الشيعة إن زيارة الحسين تعدل عشرين حجة The Sheikh, he said, Ikhwani, in another example, if we look at the issue of Al-Hajj, he said that Al-Hajj is a great form of ibadah. With the people of Al-Islam, it is a pillar from the pillars of Al-Islam. With the Shiite, on the other hand, they consider going to the Musaleem or the grave of Hussein as being greater than performing the Hajj. As they mentioned in their book, Wasail as Shi'i is mentioned, that they said anyone who visits the grave of Hussein, then that is better than performing Hajj 20 times. ولهذا أيها الإخوة يعني من أسباب نشر القبورية في العالم الإسلامي هي هذه الفرقة. فإن النعمان بن المفيد وهم المعظمين عندهم في القرن الخامس ألف كتابا اسمه الحج إلى المشاهد المشاهد يقصدون بها تلك القبور التي يعظمونها The Sheikh said brothers the spread of the process where people are worshiping graves it comes from this group they have a lot to do with that there's a man by the name of Nu'man Ibn Mufid and he's from the 5th century he wrote a book called Pilgrimage to the graves. He said the book is called Al Hajj. But what he meant by the book that he wrote, he talked about Al Hajj of making pilgrimage and traveling to the different grave sites of their saints. ولهذا عندهم أنه إذا زرت قبر الحسين كما في كتاب بحار الأنوار قال فيه وَإِذَا زُرْتَهُ فَقُلْ يَا مَوْلَاي أَيْتَيْتُكَ خَائِفًا فَأَمِّنِّي وَأَتَيْتُكَ مُسْتَجِيرًا فَأَجِرْنِي وهذا والعياذ بالله غاية الشرك بالله عز وجل والكفر بالله عز وجل He said in that book Bihar al-Anwar is written in there giving people instructions if you happen to go and you visit the grave of Hussein you should say oh my leader my protector I have come to you in a state of fear, so protect me. And I've come to you in a state of need, so please assist me and take away from me that need. The Sheikh said, this with Ahl Sunnah is shirk in and of itself. ولهذا عندهم من هذه العقائد الفاسدة ما يطول تتبعه والنظر فيه. ولكن نختصر في هذا المقام فننتقل إلى قضية في قضية موقفهم من توحيد الأسماء والصفات. Sheikh said concerning this issue about the shirk that they have in Allah's ibad and His uluhiya, there are a lot of things that can be mentioned, but we're going to make this thing short because of the situation, and we're going to go now to how they make shirk in al-asma wa in the sifat of Allah. أما الأسماء والصفات عند أهل السنة والجماعة. فهم يعتقدون أن الله عز وجل له الأسماء الحسنى والصفات العلا كما جاء في كتاب الله في سنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وفق قول الله عز وجل ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير. شيخ سر as relates to أهل السنة والجماعة the issue of the توحيد of Allah's names and attributes we believe that Allah Ta'ala's names are all beautiful names. And Allah's names, all of them are exalted. And this is as a result of what has come in the kitab and the authentic sunnah. Like what Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran, there is nothing like unto him. And he is all seeing and all hearing. ولهذا مذهب وعقيدة الشيعة الإمامية مرت بمرحلتين وهكذا أهل الأهواء ليس لهم ثبات فعقائدهم مضطربة 
لأنها لا تقوم على أصل ثابت. Sheikh said as for the Shi'a, the Imamia, they have two marhalas, two distinct eras, two distinct ways of what they were upon. He said this is the way it is with the people of desires, because in what they are upon, there is no establishment upon it. ولهذا في أوائلهم أوائل الشيعة الإمامية كانوا يعتقدون بتمثيل الله عز وجل بخلقه يمثلون الله تعالى بخلقه ولهذا يقول ابن حزم عن هشام بن الحكم الرافضي الذي نسبت له مقالة التمثيل قال هشام إن ربه سبعة أشبار بشبر نفسه تعالى الله عما يقولون The Sheikh said the first Shiite the original ones, they used to make tamthil about Allah Azza wa Jal, meaning that they said that Allah looked like something. They were given image or form to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we find Al Imam Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah ta'ala, writing when he was refuting a Shiite in the past whose name was Hisham ibn Hakam. This man said that Allah Azza wa Jal, he has. 17 cubit feet within himself and he has made himself in that way. They believe that Allah Ta'ala actually looked like a human being. And they also believe that Allah Ta'ala had the five senses. He sees, he smells, he hears, he tastes, he feels, he feels. أما في أواخر المئة الثالثة فاتجه مذهب الشيعة الإمامية إلى القول بالتعطيل بعد أن كانوا يقولون بالتمثيل بسبب اختلاطهم بالمعتزلة. فلما اختلطوا بالمعتزلة قالوا بمقالة التعطيل حتى لا تكاد تفرق بينهم وبين مذهب المعتزلة هذا السبب الأول وقد يكون سبب آخر لأن مقالة التمثيل بحمد الله تنفر منها الفطر السليمة فلجأوا إلى هذه العقيدة عقيدة التعطيل التي ظاهرها التنزيه الشيخ said the latter part Shiite they were on what is known as التعطيل التعطيل means when Allah describes certain characteristics to himself, they come and say, no, they don't accept that. So when Allah described about himself that he does this, he's like this, they said, no, it doesn't mean that. The Sheikh said, and the reason for that, why did they fall into a ta'til, the very opposite of what they used to do at the beginning, where they used to say, Allah looks like a human being. Now they came later on and said, no, Allah doesn't have these kinds of characteristics. He said, one reason is because they were mixing with the Mu'tazila. And as you know, the Mu'tazila were of the opinion that Allah's attributes, they used to make ta'til. The Mu'tazila would say, Allah, he doesn't have these attributes. He said, that's the first reason. He said, another reason is, the first people who were saying that Allah looks like a human being, he said, the natural fitra, the natural disposition, it refuses that. It doesn't accept that. So as a result of that, they left that first state that they were on and then they started to deny Allah's attributes. وَلَأَنَّ نَنْتَقِلِ لَقَضِيَّهُ مَوْقِفِ الْإِمَامِيَّةِ مِنَ الصَّحَابَةِ وَالصَّحَابَةِ رِضْوَانُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ أَهْلُ السُنَّةِ يَعْتَقِدُونَ فَضْلَهُمْ وَلَا يَعْتَقِدُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مَعْصُومُونَ مِنَ الْخَطَأِ وَاللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ أَثْنَى عَلَيْهِمْ فِي أَكْثَرْ مِنْ مَوْضِعِ قال الله عز وجل قد رضي الله عن المؤمنين إذ يبايعونك تحت الشجرة وقال محمد رسول الله والذين معه شداء على الكفار وحماء بينهم قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تسبوا أصحابي فلو أنفق أحدكم مثل أحد ذهب ما بلغ مد أحدهم ولا نصيفة Now after the, after the issue of the Tawheed we now move to another issue and that's the issue of the Sahaba the companions of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum ajma'een. He said, as for Ahl sunnah then Ahl sunnah establishes, they establish the virtue of the companions. And in establishing the fadl and the virtues of the companions, that doesn't mean that they see them as being ma'asum. They're not ma'asumun. They're not infallible and they're not mistakeless. 
Allah Azza wa Jal with Ahl Sunnah, we see that Allah Ta'ala has praised them numerous occasions in the Quran and the Prophet in his authentic Sunnah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, verily Allah is pleased with those who gave you the bay'ah under the tree. So Allah is pleased with them. Another ayah Allah Ta'ala mentioned, Muhammad is the Rasul of Allah. And those people who are with him, they are tough against the kuffar. And between themselves, they have a rahmah. So that's Allah praising them. The Prophet, he said about them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't curse my companions. For verily the one, I swear by the one who his hands, my soul is in his hands. If one of you were to spin the likes of Mount Uhud, it would never reach a, 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 a portion of what they spent if you were to spin in gold. وَلِهَذَا فَهَؤُلَاءِ الشِّعَ الْإِمَامِيَةِ وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ يَعْتَقِدُونَ أَنَّ الرَّافِضَةِ ارْتَدُّوا بَعْدَ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم يَعْتَقِدُونَ أَنَّ الصَّحَابَةِ ارْتَدُّوا بَعْدَ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم إِلَّا بِضْعَاتُ نَفَرٍ مِّنْهُمْ And because of this, we have to mention, that's how Ahl al-Sunnah understand the companions. He said, it's, as for those people, they believe in actuality, that the companions, radiyallahu anhum wa ardahum, they believe that they apostated after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. They believe this, that they left the religion except only a few of them remained in al-Islam. فَفِي كِتَابِ الْكَافِي يَنْسِبُونَ رِوَايَةَ لِأَبِي جَعْفِرْ مُحَمَّدٍ الْبَاقِرْ أنه يقول كان الناس أهل ردة بعد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إلا ثلاثة المقداد وأبو ذر وسلمان الفارسي فهذه العقيدة الفاسدة التي تعتقد أن الصحابة كلهم كفروا إلا عدد قليل. The Sheikh said in their book Al Kafi they brought a narration that they said was from Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Baqi it said that he said that the people they apostated after the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from all of the companions with the exception of three of them. They remained in Al-Islam. The first one was Al-Miqdad. They said, stayed a Muslim. Salman Al-Farisi, stayed a Muslim. And Abu Dhar Al-Ghaffari, stayed a Muslim. That's their point of view. They feel that it's not enough for a person to reject the wilaya. Like you have to accept that wilaya that Ali deserves the, to be in that position, but that's not enough. With them, concerning the companions, it is necessary for an individual to free himself from Abu Bakr and from Umar radiallahu anhuma. فَلِهَذَا يُرَدِّدُونَ لَا وَلَاءَ إِلَّا بِبَرَى and this is why they repeat and repeat. They say there is no allegiance, no wala, no allegiance, except that you have to have al-bara. Al-bara means you have to subtract yourself from Abu Bakr and Umar. يقول المجلسي في كتابه حق اليقين صفحة 519 يقول وعقيدتنا التبرؤ من الأصنام الأربعة أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان ومعاوية والنساء الأربع عائشة وحفصة وهند وأم الحكم ومن جميع أتباعهم وأشياعهم وأنهم شر خلق الله على وجه الأرض والعياذ بالله المجلس يمنشن in the book that he wrote that the aqida with us is that you have to have al-bara'a you have to free yourself if you're going to be a true Shiite you have to see free yourself from the four idols and those four idols are Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu. And he read, and he mentioned as well, in addition to that, you have to free yourself from certain women. You have to free yourself from Aisha, from Hafsa, and from Hind, and everybody who was similar to them. The Sheikh said that the man said in Majlisi, these individuals who were mentioned, they are the worst of Allah's creation, and what they did is not acceptable. أما موقفهم من القرآن الذي يعظمه أهل الإسلام فيمكن تلخيصه في نقاط فهم يعتقدون أن القرآن له ظاهر وباطن 
As for the Quran, ikhwani, how they believe, and it's different from what Ahl Sunnah believe in the Quran, because Ahl Sunnah, they make the ta'zim of the Quran. The people of Islam say that the Quran is important. As for these people, there are different points that they make concerning the Quran that should be considered. The first one is that they say that the Quran has an apparent meaning, and that the Quran has a hidden meaning as well. ويعتقدون بأن القرآن ناقص وهذا مصرح به في كتبهم جاء في الكافي رواية ولا شك أنها مكذوبة عن جعفر الصادق أنه يقول عندنا مصحف فاطمة وما يدريهم ما مصحف فاطمة فيه مثل قرآنكم هذه مرات هذا موجود في الكافي ومصرح به نعم the Sheikh said from these points about the Qur'an, not only do they believe there's an apparent Qur'an and an hidden Qur'an, they also believe that the Qur'an that we have is incomplete, that it's naqus. And this is something that they say clearly in the book Al-Kafi, and that's from their books that we mentioned. And they said that Jafar al-Sadiq, and the Sheikh said, no doubt, Jafar al-Sadiq never said this, but they say that he said, we, the Shiite, we have the Mus'haf of Fatima. And the Mus'haf that we have of Fatima is bigger than the Qur'an that they have by many, 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 many times. يقول ابن المفيد في كتاب أوائل المقالات صفحة 91 إن الأخبار جاءت مستفيضة عن أئمة الهدى وآل محمد باختلاف القرآن وما أحدثه بعض الظالمين فيه من الحذف والنقصان ولا شك أن هذه المقولة تكذيب لقول الله تعالى إنا نحن نزلنا الذكر وإنا له لحافظون This man ibn Mufid in a book that he wrote concerning what they believe concerning the Quran ibn Mufid said it has come to us with many transmissions and narrations that the Qur'an has been mixed up and it was mixed up by people who went astray and people who are corrupt and evil. So as a result of that, it has been changed and it is also incomplete. That's what he said. The Sheikh said, no doubt, this statement is takdeeb of the Qur'an, is denying and rejecting what Allah established in the Qur'an when he said, verily, we revealed the dhikr. And verily, we will protect it. ومن المسائل التي تميز بها ولأجلها سم بهذا الاسم هي مسألة الإمامة. أما الإمامة عند أهل السنة، فالإمام يعتقد أهل السنة أنه ليس معصوما كما يعتقد الشيعة الإمامية. وله السمع والطاعة في المعروف. أما في المعصية فلا سمع له ولا طاعة. والإمام يسمى إمام ويسمى خليفة ويسمى ولي أمر وتثبت هذه الإمامة يكون إماما على المسلمين بأي وسيلة كانت سواء بالاختيار اختاره المسلمون وجعله إماما أو بالعهد ولاية العهد يعني كان الإمام بعده كتب كتابا بأن فلان يكون بعدي إمام أو بالقهر والغلبة فعند ذلك يكون إمام عند أهل السنة. The Sheikh said another thing that they have become known by and what they're different in أهل السنة with is this whole issue about الإمامة the إمامة being responsible in a position of leadership the إمام the leader of the Muslims. This is why they are called الإمامية because they came up with a new concept and a new definition. And the Sunnah, concerning the leader of the Muslims, we believe that the Imam is not ma'asum. He's not mistakeless. The leader of the Muslims, he's not ma'asum. He has the right that we listen to him and we obey him and what he tells us to do, which is ma'roof, is correct, is from the deen. But we don't listen to him and we don't obey him in what is in disobedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. And the Muslims of Ahl Sunnah call him different names. They call him the Imam. They call him the Khalifa. They call him the Waliul Amr. He went on to also mention that the way he becomes the Imam, the ithbat of how the man becomes an Imam with Ahl Sunnah is in many different ways. He could become the Imam in that 
the Muslims themselves choose him and say, you're the imam. So he becomes the imam. He also can become the imam in that the one who was the leader before him, he says to him or to the people, he writes a book, he lets the people know, I want him to be the leader after me. Ahl al accept this. Number three, Ahl al accepts that if a man, he were to overcome the people and overwhelm the people, and then as a result of that, he was the leader over them, all of these ways, Ahl al-Sunnah, they accept that man as being their imam. Amma عند Ahl al-Sunnah kathalik, fal imam ظاهر وليس بخفي ظاهر ولأنه لا تتحقق مصالح الدين ولا مصالح المسلمين إلا بوجود إمام ظاهر كما أن الإمام وسيلة لإقامة الدين وليس غاية. الشيخ said from أهل السنة how أهل السنة أهل السنة understand the imam is that the imam is apparent people see him they know him. And he's not someone who's hidden. He said that if the Imam for Ahl Sunnah, the Imam for the Muslims was hidden, then the, the needs of the people will not be fulfilled. The goals and the objectives of the religion, the benefits of the people coming to them, being brought to them, and the harms being taken away. If the Imam was hidden, this could never happen. Ahl Sunnah see the Imam as a vehicle to get benefit in their lives. But he is not the goal and he is not the objective. ولهذا عند اهل السنه يجوز تعدد الائمه فيجوز لكل قطر من اقطار المسلمين ان يكون هناك امام ولا يضر في ذلك في جريان احكام الشريعه على هذا الامام وهو واجب السمع والطاعه وان تعددت اقطار بلاد المسلمين كما هو محل اتفاق بين اهل السنه والجماعه. الشيخ يسال اخواني for this reason Ahl al-Sunnah are of the opinion that it's permissible for there to be multiple Imams, multiple Muslim leaders at the same time in different parts of the world. And it doesn't hurt and it doesn't prevent from the ahkam of al-Islam from being practiced and implemented, the fact that there are multiple Imams. In each and every one of these places, if there is a leader, then the people of that locale have the responsibility to listen to him and to obey him. And this is something that the people of Islam from Ahl al-Sunnah have ittifaq upon. Amma عند الشيعة الإمامية فعندهم أن الإمامة أحد أركان الإسلام العظام وأهم مطالب الدين ولهذا يقول من مات ولم يعرف إمام الزمان مات ميتة جاهلية. The Sheikh said, as for the Shia al Imamiyah, they believe that the Imam, it is a pillar from the pillar of their religion, from the deen. And they believe that it is the single most important thing that the religion of Al Islam is calling to and focusing on and putting attention upon. And that's why you hear their famous statement that they say, they believe, whoever dies, and he doesn't know the Imam during his time, then he has died the death of the time of Al Jahiliya. ويعتقدون أن هؤلاء الأئمة معصومون عن الخطأ ولا يقع منهم شيء كما أنهم منصوص عليهم هؤلاء الأئمة والإمام عندهم منصب إلهي وفوق درجة النبوة والرسالة كما صرحوا بذلك في كتبهم كذلك يغلون في هؤلاء الأئمة الذين يعتقدون أنهم منصوص عليهم من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم they believe that their imams are infallible and that they are mistakeless and they can't make mistakes and that they don't fall into anything that's in contradiction to the truth. And this is something that has been mentioned in this Mansus Alayhi. It's something that's written in their books. They put the imam at a position of being God, Ilahi, to be like a God. They make the imam above the messengers. They make the um, Imam above prophecy and nubuwa. And because of this, they have an extraordinary level of hulu and extremism and going overboard with their Imams. وَلِهَذَا <laughs> 
فيما يزعمون ويفترون لهذا الأئمة كما ذكر الشيخ عثمان ذكر لكم أسماءهم وهم معروفون علي ثم بعده الحسن ثم الحسين ثم علي زين العابدين ثم محمد الباقر ثم جعفر الصادق ثم موسى بن جعفر الكاظم ثم علي بن موسى الرضا ثم محمد بن علي الجواد ثم علي بن محمد الحادي ثم الإمام الحادي عشر هو محمد بن الحسن العسكري ولهذا هذا محمد بن الحسن العسكري كما ذكر أهل الأخبار أنه ولد يعني وجد لا ليس له ولد وأنه عقيم فاختلقوا عند ذلك أن له ولد اختفى في سرداب سامراء وهو محمد بن الحسن العسكري الذي يعتقدون أنه سوف يخرج في آخر الزمان The Sheikh, he said that these people, they believe that there are 12 Imams and that's why they're called the 12 Imamers. And they also believe that Allah Azzawajal mentioned that these 12 people are the Imams. Just not something that they are claiming was made up or they're making it up. They're saying that Allah mentioned these 12. And that these Imams, that they have hukuk, they have rights, that the companions according to them came and stole their rights. He said, I believe that a Sheikh Uthman al Khamis, he mentioned the names of these Imams to you. The 12 Imams, or the 11 ones that they mentioned, they made up the last one, where you have Ali and then Hasib ibn Ali and then Hussein, son of Ali, and then Ali, Zain Abedin, and then Muhammad Baqir, and then Jafar al Sadiq, and then Musa, and then Ali, and then Muhammad, and then Muhammad ibn Ali. And then Ali ibn Muhammad, and then the last one was Muhammad Hassan al Askari. This one was the 11th one who the history tell us he didn't even have any children, and yet they came and created a child for him that he never had. So they consider that these 12 people are the Imams. As for the last one, they gave him some characteristics, a lot of karam about him, and he is um, the one who was there in Samara, and they're waiting for him to come out. ولهذا لأجل هذا الغائب عندهم تتعطل أحكام الشريعة فلا جهاد إلا مع الإمام الغائب ولا جمعة إلا مع هذا الإمام الغائب ولهذا عطلوا كثير من الأحكام حتى جاء مطلع القرن الرابع عشر الهجري جاء الخميني ببدعة جديدة ابتدعها كما أنهم ابتدعوا بدعة الإمام الخفي فدينهم قائم على الكذب كما صرح بذلك الأئمة فهم من أكذب الناس في النقليات من أجهل الناس في العقليات دينهم قائم على الكذب والعياذ بالله جاء هذا الخميني بولاية الفقيه وزعم أن الفقيه ينوب عن الإمام المنتظر في بعض الأحكام ومن ذلك إعلان الحرب والجهاد ومن ذلك الجمعة أما قبل العام 1400 كان الروافض والإمامية على, هذا على هذه العقيدة الباطلة الشيخ قال أن this thing that they believe about the Imams, this last Imam who they're waiting for, who they created, it's a figment of their imagination. While they are waiting for him, they have destroyed and suspended the ahkam of al-Islam. For an example, they believe that there's no jihad until this Imam comes. It has to be done with him. That there's no salat of al-Jum'ah. You don't have to attend Jum'ah until this Imam comes, and then you can attend, and you should attend the Jum'ah. Another example is the issue of other ahkam in al-Islam that they destroyed and suspended while they're waiting for this particular imam. Until the 14th century when al-Khumaini al came, the famous leader of Iran, he invented, introduced, made a new bid'ah that the ones before him didn't say. He came up with a concept that he called Wilayatul Faqih, the Wilaya of the Faqih, the responsibility and the leadership of the jurists. Not the Wilaya of the Imams, the Wilaya of the Imam, the Wilaya of the Faqih, the jurists. He came and he said, Now, there is, it's permissible for the Faqih, for the leader from amongst them. Now, the Imam is not here. Now, he is the, the na'ib, or the deputy of the imam that they're waiting for. So it's permissible for him to say, okay, we can go to war here. It's 
permissible for the faqih now to say, okay, this is jihad. It's permissible for, permissible for the people to perform as Juma because he is the deputy of the imam that they're waiting for. And this is an innovation that was not known before him. And from their beliefs, يعني تحل إشكالات كثيرة عند بعض الناس وهذا الإشكال أن بعضهم ربما تواجهه بهذه العقائد التي تنقلها من هذه الكتب فيزعم أن هذا هذا الاعتقاد لا يعتقده وأن الشيعة الإمامية لا يعتقدون ذلك فيجيبك بالنفي مما قد يعني يوجد عندك نوع من سوء الفهم والإشكال وهذه العقيدة التي سوف نتكلم عنها عندهم عقيدة التقيه. Sheikh said from their aqidah that is fasid that is the fact that some people have a problem who are not from them. Some people when trying to understand the Shiite they think when they talk to them that sometimes they may be truthful in what they're saying and maybe you are misunderstanding what they're saying. But when you bring it to the attention and you say, do you people believe in this? They'll say, no, we don't believe in this. You just have some misunderstanding about the issue. So it causes some ishkal with the people. Are they okay? Are they not okay? He said, and this is from the aqidah. That is the aqidah of at-tuqya, at-tuqya. ولكن هل التقية موجودة عند أهل الإسلام وعند أهل السنة؟ نعم التقية عند أهل السنة تخالف التقية عند الشيعة الإمامية فالتقية جاءت مذكورة في القرآن كما في قول الله تعالى إلا أن تتقوا منهم تقاه وهذه جاءت في كتاب الله في حال الاضطرار كما صرح بذلك الأئمة منهم ابن جرير في تفسيره وهي مع الكفار خاصة لا مع المسلمين ولهذا يقول معاذ بن جبل كانت التقية في بدء الإسلام يعني في جدة الإسلام قبل قوة المسلمين أما اليوم فقد أعز الله المسلمين أن يتقوا منهم تقاه. The Sheikh said, as for the people of Islam, the issue of Tuqya is with Ahl Sunnah, it's from Al Islam. But the way Ahl Sunnah understand the Tuqya, it is different from the way the Shiites understand and implement the Tuqya. The word tuqya and this concept has come to us in the Quran as Allah will ta'ala mention except that you fear them by using a tuqya. The great scholar of a tafsir, Imam Muhammad ibn Jarir, rahimahullah ta'ala, and given the tafsir of this ayat, he said a tuqya, the Muslims are allowed to use it based on this ayat. When they are forced to use it, they have no alternative and it should be used against the kuffar. And for that reason, the scholar, I didn't catch his name, from Ahl Sunnah had mentioned the tuqya was present in the beginning of Al Islam, before the Muslims had power and might and ability. And it was used against the kuffar. But today, during his time, the author, then this tuqya is something that we don't use because Al Islam is powerful and it is mighty and therefore not needed. ولهذا التقية عندهم هي كتمان الحق هكذا يعرفونه كما عرف ذلك المفيد في كتابه شرح قائد الصدوق يقول التقية كتمان الحق وصدر الاعتقاد فيه وكتمان المخالفين يعني عدم المجاهرة بالاعتقاد The man ibn al-Mufid he wrote in one of the books that the meaning of التقية with them is to cover up the truth and to conceal what you truly believe, to cover up the truth, and to make the setter of what you truly believe, to, 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 to conceal it, so what you actually believe is not known. وَلِهَذَا عِنْدَهُمُ التُّقِيَةَ تِسْعَةُ أَعْشَارِ الدِّينِ وَلَا دِينَ لِمَنْ لَا تُقِيَةَ لَهُ وَيَرْوُونَ ذَلِكَ عَنْ جَعْفَرِ الصَّادِقِ عَنْ جَعْفَرِ الصَّادِقِ they are of the opinion concerning this tuqya that it is an integral part of their religion. To the point that they even said that the one who doesn't make tuqya, he doesn't have any religion in essence. If you don't make tuqya as a Shiite, then your religion is suspect. 
And they say that this is one of the narrations and the claims of Jafar al-Sadiq, and it's not true. لماذا لجأت الشيعة الإمامية لهذه العقيدة؟ طبعاً هم دينهم كما قد قدمنا قائم على الكذب هم كذبوا وكذبوا على الإمام علي علي رضي الله عنه وعلى من بعده فلا يعجزهم الكذب لماذا لجأوا إلى هذه العقيدة؟ لماذا هم يعملون هذه العقيدة؟ لجأوا لهذه العقيدة لأنه لم خلافة أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان رضي الله عنهم عندهم غير معتبرة وغير شرعية وعلي رضي الله عنه كما تثبت كتب التاريخ كان موجودا وبايعهم وتابعهم على ذلك فزعموا في إجابة الاستشكال هذا أن عليا رضي الله عنه إنما فعل ذلك تقية من هؤلاء شيخ يكفوت تكوشن يسأل why do you think that these people came up with this concept of a tuqya where does it come from and why did they make it a part of the aqidah what's the wisdom behind that he said that um, no doubt these people from their religion is they're liars and they have no problem with lying and introducing ideas that have no proofs for them and no precedence in the religion so we look at the issue of the khilafah of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, we find that they consider the Khilafah of these three great illustrious companions, عنهم, they don't accept it, they don't consider it. But we know historically, the history told us that Ali, عنهم, he gave the bay'ah to all three of them, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. So what they did was, they came and they introduced this idea of tuqya to get out of this problem, from the problems, and they said, now, nah. Ali gave the bay'ah to them, but he wasn't true. He was just doing it for tuqya. That's what they say. كذلك من أسباب لجوهم إلى هذه العقيدة الباطلة أن الأئمة عندهم كما قد قدمنا معصومون لا يخطئون بل يعتقدون أنهم لا يحدث منهم النسيان فلهذا إذا ثبت عن هؤلاء الأئمة أمرا يخالف ما أصلوا في دينهم قالوا إنما صدر ذلك منهم على سبيل التقية Another reason why they introduce this issue of al-tukya is that as we mentioned they believe that their imams are infallible and that they don't make mistakes and that they don't forget so what happens is because they are not in fact infallible and they do make mistakes and they do forget when it's found that they did or said something that's in contradiction to what they said or to the truth, they'll come and they'll say, no, that thing that he did, the thing that he said, it was only done and said because of a tukia. ولهذا عندهم أن التقية في كل شيء يروون عن جعفر الصادق أن التقية في كل شيء إلا في موضعين إلا في شرب النبيذ والمسح على الخفين فإنهم لا يتقون في هذا الأمر ولا يعملون عقيدة التقية لاحظ التقية في كل شيء. They said that uh, in terms of the permissibility and the ability of the Shia to use a tukia, they said it's permissible to use it in everything and in anything. That you can use a tukia in everything and anything with the exception of two things. They don't allow the usage of a tukia in the drinking of a nabil, which is a type of intoxicant that was present and is still present. You can't do tuqya in that according to them. And the second thing is you can't do a tuqya when it comes to wiping on the leather socks. There's an issue that they don't see as being permissible. The wiping on the socks is something they don't see permissible and you don't allow, they don't allow a tuqya be, to be done in that mas'ala. ولهذا إذا ورد شيء يخالف ما هم يعتقدونه قالوا إنما فعل ذلك تقية. So anything that is mentioned that goes against what they believe, if you find a contradiction, they're going to be quick to respond. No, the reason why that contradiction is there is تقية. ولهذا يعني يمكن أن نختصر أن أن التقية والعياذ بالله من أعظم الأسباب. والعقائد التي صرفت كثيرا من الشيعة عن اتباع الحق 
لأنهم كلما سمعوا شيئا من الحق عن أئمتهم إما يخالف ما هم عليه من الباطل قالوا إنما فعلوا ذلك تقية He said that this Tokyo issue, Ikhwani, a lot can be mentioned, but to shorten the discussion, he said this Tokyo is one of the greatest reasons and causes that prevent some of the regular Shiite from following the truth. Because sometimes you will find some of the Imams will say the truth and have said the truth. But what happens is the regular people when they see that the Imam says something that's truthful, one of the scholars, he says something that's truthful, it is explained to him, no, he only said that as a result of Tuqya. So it's difficult for them to ever take the truth because when they see the truth, they think it was there because of a Tuqya. ومن عقائدهم والعياذ بالله الفاسدة القول بالبداء على الله تعالى وهم هنا يشابهون اليهود في هذه العقيدة الباطلة ولهذا عند معنى البداء أن الله سبحانه وتعالى قد يبدو له شيئا ويظهر له شيء تعالى الله عما يقولون فيغير أمره ويغير رأيه تعالى الله عما يقولون. Another thing that these people have is in their aqeed is what is called al-bada an Allah azza wa jal and in reality this thing that they believe in is something that's with the yahud it's not from al-islam. And al-bada'u, what is it? It's that Allah Azawajal, something may appear to Allah or come to his knowledge. Something may come to him in his knowledge and so he changes something. Because, for an example, there's a ruling that Allah wants, but then something comes to Allah that makes Allah want to change that ruling, so he changes it. The ability that Allah has where something could come to him and, and he thinks about it so to speak and then he changes that thing ولهذا يعتقدون ما عبد ان انه ما عبد الله عز وجل بشيء مثل البداء and they believe that Allah was never worshiped with anything better than this concept لماذا لجأوا الى هذه العقيدة why did they say this and use this in the aqeedah يعتقدون ان ائمتهم they believe that they're imams. They know the unseen and they know what's going to be in the future. So, so if the one of the imams tell them that something is going to happen in the future, but something happens other than what he said was going to happen. فإما أن يكذبوا بالأمر أو يكذبوا أئمتهم وينسبوا الخطأ إليهم نعم فإذا أحدثوا هذه العقيدة فهم لا يعجزهم والعياذ بالله الكذب So the point here, إخواني, is they came up with this concept of beda because the imams, they believe, know the future so the Imam may say this and that and this is going to happen in the future. But then it doesn't happen. So they come and they say that's because the Imam he said it was going to happen but Allah, something appeared to Allah, Allah came to know so Allah changed it. <laughs> Allah changed that thing and that's why it didn't happen. Because they don't want to say that the Imams lied and made a mistake. And this is why they see in that book and that we've been mentioned Bihar al-Anwar. They say that some of the Imams said, إن حدثناك عن أمر أنه يجيء منها هنا فجاء منها هنا يعني على خلاف ما أخبرناك فإن الله يصنع ما يشاء. The Imam said in that book Bihar al-Anwar, if we the Imams were to tell you people that something was going to happen in the future with our knowledge of the unseen and then it came on other than what we said, then you should know that Allah does whatever he wants to do. Allah changed it. وَإِنْ حَدَّثْنَاكَ الْيَوْمَ بِحَدِيثٍ وَحَدَّثْنَاكَ غَدًا بِخِلَافِهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَمْحُ مَا شَاءَ وَيَثْبِتُ And if we tell you something today, and then tomorrow, later on, we tell you the opposite of that. And Allah Ta'ala wipes away and erases whatever he wants to wipe away, whatever he wants to erase. And this is why they used to say to some of their followers that the situation, the power, the might, the amr was going to return back to them after 70 years, 7-0. 
ولما انقضت تلك المدة ولم يتحقق من ذلك شيء لجأوا إلى البداء وزعموا أن الله سبحانه وتعالى بدا لهم خلاف ما كانوا يقولون And it, according to them, became apparent to Allah Azza wa Jal that he changed. Something came apparent to him to make him feel or to change what they prophesied and projected was going to happen. And the last issue we want to mention here from their aqidah that is no good is the aqidah of al-dhuhur, al-dhuhur with the Imamis. And this thing, in reality, it resembles a Sufi concept. They believe that the Imam is possible that he can appear before the people. And that is in accordance to when the Imam wants him to appear. بمثل هذا الظهور الذي يعتقدونه أن علي رضي الله عنه ظهر لفلان أو أن الحسين ظهر لفلان لأنهم كما تعرفون لا عقل صريح ولا, دي ولا دين صحيح نسأل الله السلام والعافية In their books you can find that their books are filled up with examples of them claiming that Ali ibn Abi Talib appeared to someone because the Imam allowed it. Hussein can come and appear to someone because the Imam allowed it. And that's because these people, they actually believe that there is no intellect that is well and there's no deen that is authentic. May Allah protect us from that travesty. Of course, in, this, in, the, in, the, in mentioning these issues, the goal and the objective is just to explain to the people and to expose the truth and see that it stands out distinct from the falsehood that people need to know. And let the person praise Allah, worship Allah for the favor that he bestowed upon you and that he gave you the correct and authentic aqidah. التي هداه الله عز وجل إليها. The one that Allah Taala guided him to. ويلزم كتاب الله عز وجل وسنة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. And let the person hold on to the book of Allah and the Sunnah of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. فهؤلاء لما أعرضوا عن كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Because those imamias, when they turned away from the book of Allah and from the Sunnah of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. وقعوا في هذا الضلال المبين. They fell into this clear, distinct, manifest evil. نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى يهدي الضال وأن يرده إلى الحق ردا جميلا وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to guide the one who went astray back to the proper way. He guides whoever he wants to guide and salutations of peace and blessings upon his Rasul and his Nabi Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم.